when grief comes, and it will, and sometimes it comes at a very, very early age. The loss of a parent has often experienced that, that separation anxiety from a child that's maybe just only three months old. The, uh, the, the tendency for people to hide death from children causes them often to wonder what's really going on and sometimes the terminology they use really complicates things because they may say uh, grandma's going to heaven and in their little concrete thinking mind that means grandma will be back soon she's just on a trip and so it's important that children understand that they are a part of the grief when it happens. But they need to be told on their own level. Next Wednesday, I mean next Sunday evening, the lesson and focus is, is going to be upon that recovering process. Uh, tonight's focus is more on what I call the midstream part of the process. And I have chosen this picture. And I think you're familiar with the saying that goes with this. Don't change horses in the middle of the stream. And I think this is the way a lot of people feel about grief, is that they are out in the middle of the river of grief and they're trying to catch this other horse because they're convinced they've got to leave the horse that they were on totally behind and get on something new and, and something so different. But I, I, I really disagree. I think that in all actuality, we ride the same horse across the stream. That horse is us. It's our soul. It's our experiences. It's our fears. It's our joys. It's our sorrows. It's our delight. It's our memories. It's our hopes. It's our dreams, and yes, there is some alteration that's going to take place, but riding across the stream of grief with the Christian is God. Like the psalmist wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. And sometimes people in deep grief think that the Lord is on this horse, but because someone they died loved and maybe in a very tragic way then God's not going to go with them the rest of the way that he has abandoned them and that there is really no hope that he will ever come back and be a part of their life and a lot of people experience that because for many people their their connection with God is based upon feeling his presence and it's very much an emotional thing, but we're aware that the foundation of our life is not based upon that, it's based upon our faith, based upon the Word of God. And when the psalmist wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, that's not based upon a feeling. It's based upon the reality that God has given us that we are to believe it whether we feel it or not it is still true because I have known of times when I've had a feeling of uneasiness and it turned out to be nothing the feeling didn't make it happen and I've also had times when I thought everything was going fine and I found out that it wasn't and feeling that everything was going fine didn't help either I had to deal with reality I had to deal with that which has which is true the truth itself and the truth that we believe in and the truth that we hold to is the Word of God. And we know God's with us even when we don't feel it because Jesus said in His own words in the last part of the Great Commission, and behold, the King James Version says, Lo, I might say, look up, wake up. He said, I am with you always to the end of the ages. And by faith, we can know He is with us.
even though our grief and our pain may cause us to think that He really isn't and that He really doesn't care. And sometimes, if what we're looking for is that feeling again, we're relying upon something that will come and go as the pain comes and goes. So we rely upon the faith that we have, that the Word of God is true, that Jesus will walk with those who walk in the light, whether we are feeling aware of it or not. I remember at Broken Arrow when I was there preaching, there was one particular song, and I'd already exited the auditorium, and this was the last song before the dismissal prayer. You know how we preachers are. we got to get to the back door to catch those who leave early. And so I was at the back door, and they started singing this song. And I have to admit that the hair on the back of my neck stood up because I got so emotionally involved in that song that it was amazing even to me. I don't remember any other song causing that to happen to me. I do remember one time when I got lost that happened to the back of my neck. The hair stood up on its end because I thought the javelina pigs were out there about to get me in our Texas hunting uh, situation that we were in at the time. But the point that I want you to make is, is that you're not riding the horse to the middle of the stream to have to leave it there and then get on something entirely different because some people approach grief from that perspective and they see themselves having fallen into the river not only unable to get on the horse that's going to the other side but not even seeing a horse that's going to the other side and this is why it's so important that we realize the crossing of the stream of grief is me, myself, I, and God, and my church friends, and those who love me, and the experiences of life, and the good memories, and all of that's going with me across the stream. And it's that midpoint of the stream that I want to talk about tonight and spend a little bit of time there. So this is when grief comes, our third session. Focus is going to be tonight on feelings. I haven't talked much about them, but we're going to talk about them tonight. The feelings that go with grief, and I've given you a handout that has a rather interesting illustration on one side, and we'll get to that in a few moments. Do you remember these from the last two times? I will not always feel as I do now. You remember me asking you to write those on a 3 by 5 card? Paste one of them on your bathroom mirror, paste another one on the refrigerator, and then carry another one in your pocket or your purse if you're going through grief. And look at that card to remind you, you are on a journey that you not only can survive, but that you can find a new and meaningful life on the other side but it takes work it takes a willingness to go through the pain and so one of the things I want to do tonight is to help you have perhaps a little bit of a different perspective of the pain and what you're going through and then the second line was I'm doing okay grief will not hurt me oh it's pain but I'm talking about a permanent hurt unless we allow it. We can fight our way through grief. And sometimes that's the way that it feels. It's almost a battle. Third line, I will make it through my loss as others have made it through theirs. I am not alone in this path. I'm not the first person who has lost someone uh, of old age. I'm not the first person who's lost someone that was young. I'm not the first person people will say who suffered a tragic death in the family. I'm not the first person, and they can go on and on. And many people who do go into a group, series, group session for recovery discover amazingly how similar other situations are with other people and how similar their reactions were and how similar their struggle is and how similar the things that help them 
help other people. And then the last one is, I will not rush through my grief. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, working 20 hours a day, getting involved in various addictions, some immoral, have all been used to escape the pain of grief. And yet most of those things do not work in the good of the individual who's suffering. In fact, I was visiting with someone just this past week about someone who had a loss and they quote, went off the deep end and they're still off the deep end. They got on that horse, got out in the middle of the stream and essentially jumped off into the river of grief. And there they are, stuck not even realizing that they're still on the same horse, they simply need to say, I'm not trying to be crass or rude, giddy up, let's move on. And so that's what some of the things they need to do. Normally when some major emotional event happens, we categorize our feelings as rather broad. In fact, growing up there was three categories. Are you mad, sad, or glad? And if you're one of those, then we know how you're feeling and what's going on in your life. And the truth is, these large categories often prevent us from really dealing with what's going on. And one of the biggest cover-ups is anger. And what it covers up, well, we'll get into that in a few moments because there are some specific things that anger tends to cover up. Because it's easier to be angry than it is to deal with what's really going on in our life. I experienced this. I'll tell you about it in a little bit. So we need to probe a little deeper. Let's take a look at this wheel right here. You don't have this. You have uh, something else that we'll get to in a few moments. Uh, what people consider the basic uh, basic emotions are, can you, can you see this light okay? Yes. Okay. A mad, sad, uh, scared, joyful, powerful, peaceful. So the bad's up here, the good's down here. Let's just say that one of the things that happens during a period of grief is I'm, I'm mad. Well, now is it more hurt because people are distant from me? Am I hostile and am I behaving sarcastically? Is my anger actually frustration or is it selfish because I'm jealous? Or how about just being hateful when I'm really just irritated and I let it get out of hand? Or perhaps even critical and I'm critical because I'm bewildered and confused. And so the only way I know how to deal with this is criticizing and that makes me mad. So just being mad is the cover for it. Until we start finding out some of the things that's really causing the loss hurt, we'll not be able to deal with them and accept them and move on from them. We could take any one of the other areas of, of scared, confused, rejected, helpless, uh, submissive, and therefore inadequate, insecure, embarrassed, all of those things on the sad end, guilty, ashamed, depressed, lonely, bored, tired, any of those things. So specifically, if someone says, I am so mad at God, why are you specifically mad at God? Well, because he could have prevented it. Could he? Or is that how you feel? Do you really believe God should have reach down his hand and stop the car from crashing. So you kind of get down to where the root of the problem is with emotions rather than simply say I'm mad, I'm sad, or I'm glad. Let's get into this little thing that you have in front of you. Uh, depending upon which side of the paper you're holding, it's either on the front or the back. So. Turn it to this side. And let's look first of all at the grief ball of emotions. What you have in the middle is denial. 
And this is so normal, even when people believe it happens, one of the first things they say is what? It's okay to talk out loud. What? I just can't believe it. This can't really have happened. This can't, this can't, this can't. And so that's kind of where it starts. And then it starts getting where these other things come inside. Uh, is it abandonment? In other words, do I no longer have this relationship? Is it dread of what's lying ahead? And then anxiety and confusion and panic and dismay and apathy and sorrow. The more we can identify what is going on, uh, as a, uh, this is an interesting one, bitterness. That's an interesting one that a lot of people may suffer. Rage, anger, fear over here. And so as we look at these feelings that we have inside of us, as we identify specifically what we, they are, some of these, some of these pains will tend to diminish because we realize what's causing the pain in our own mind is not as big as we thought it was. If it is as big as we thought it was, or perhaps even bigger, then we deal with it. There's an interesting experience that, experience that took place uh, a number of years ago. I was in a place, and uh, the people who were in charge said, I want you to think about uh, an, an event that was pretty highly emotional that you didn't like. So I did. And they said, I want you to write down the word that describes how you feel about that. So I did. I wrote down the word angry. Wrote down the word angry. And then, of all things, they said to us, I want you to write down ten more emotions that could be connected with that event. And I'm thinking, no, it's just anger. That's all it is. Well, I got to thinking. I thought, okay, frustration. Okay, irritation. Okay, hurt. And when I said that word, I started crying. It really wasn't anger. It was hurt. And I began to say to myself, why hurt? Why hurt? And the answer to that question was different than the answer to the why anger. The real answer was more important than the answer I had come up with in my mind. And so one of the things when we are grieving or when we're angry due to grief, we need to check it out because what really may be bothering us is something other than what we think is bothering us. I'm going to put that other part up here now. And it's interesting that the opposite of denial, pardon my shaky hand, maybe if I use both of them that'll help. Instead of denial, we start to accept. And as we accept, we start looking to replace these things with some of these things. As an example, uh, relief and relaxed is what we want in place of our anxiety. So one of the ways we do that is we learn how to relax. In every book I've read on dealing with grief, they all emphasize our need to eat right, to exercise, learn how to relax, breathing deeply. Why eat right? Why exercise? Why do all these other things? because our body is the carrier of our mind. And if our body gets mistreated, it, it has an effect upon the way that we think. And we start feeling bad physically, which adds to our feeling bad otherwise. And so we need to take care of ourselves. Well, I'm just not hungry. Food just doesn't taste any good. Well, under ordinary circumstances, you would know that you're doing harm to your body. I do know that there are some people in grief 
who do harm their body because they are grieving. But I'd say under ordinary conditions, most people don't stop eating because they say, I don't want to harm my body. And they stop exercising because they want to get so stiff they can't stand up. They don't do this. It's just a reaction, and sometimes you have to work to overcome that particular reaction. And what you will find is that for each of the things on this wheel, there's sorrow. We go over here, same area, there's joy. Over here, there's anguish. Over here, there's pleasure. One of the things that grieving people often do if they lose a loved one is they believe they no longer have the right to really be happy. I have even been told by people who have lost a mate that they were really enjoying something and then caught themselves and told themselves, quit it. <laughs> because it's not fair to be happy when you've lost someone you love. And under ordinary circumstances, doesn't the one you love want you to be happy? Don't they want you to grieve, but not to the point that it incapacitates you to enjoy things that are enjoyable? We took a trip to uh, Niagara Falls with uh, one of the churches I worked with. And on the edge of Niagara Falls, watching the falls come over, I watched one of the widow ladies who was only recently widowed. And I saw most of all a look of sadness because there was no one there to share it with. Because she didn't really have the right to enjoy it in her own mind. It wasn't right to be happy without him. And so one of the things that we do at midstream is we stop looking so much back at where the horse came as to where the horse ride needs to go. And we start realizing that I've got to start looking toward the other shore. I have got to start seeing what is there for me. I have got to understand that the one left behind wants me to reach the other shore and wants me to be happy again. And that's an important truth that we need to remember. I want to look at three troublesome feelings that I hear again and again, not only as I read books, but in my own experience in counseling with people. Number one, not in importance, but number one, as I mentioned, it is, is guilt. Guilt. If only I had known that when she was having that chest pain, I would have gone ahead and insisted that we go to the doctor. But she said, oh, it's nothing. So it's my fault. I'm responsible. And then there's the, I ignored what they said. There were signs I should have seen. And so a lot of guilt goes with it. Their guilt is guilt saying, the last thing we did, we, we had a fight. That's the last thing. And they got in the car and drove off and had a wreck. And the last thing I said to them was, you're not worth anything. And, that's, and, and the guilt for that can just go on and on and on and on. I want to share with you a truth, and I want you to hold it tight. Guilt has to do with unforgiven sin. Once sin is forgiven, the guilt is gone. Don't call it guilt when the guilt is gone. Call it something else. Call it sadness. Call it regret. But don't call it guilt, because guilt interferes with your relationship with God. Because guilt, unforgiven sin, separates us from God. And I've known so many people who, who say, I feel so guilty. Did you sin? Well, no. Then, then call it sad. Call it regret. 
just call it something other than tying it to sin. I, I will admit that there are some times that people do have some sin that should cause some guilt. And maybe the fight they had, the person was guilty. Well then, ask God's forgiveness as you walk in the light. As a faithful Christian, you have forgiveness. Get it. And then deal with it as regret. Something forgiven. And here's another suggestion. Pardon me. <coughs> when you pray about something that you regret deeply, and you've already talked to God, and you've made it right if you can. Now, sometimes you can't make it right with the loved one who's gone. The way you can do that, well, we'll talk about that next Sunday night. But there are several ways to do that. <coughs> but when you pray to God about this event, the first thing you need to do is to thank God for His forgiveness. Because you're not carrying the guilt anymore. And then, well, as an example, Father, I thank You so much for forgiving me of what I said and the attitude that I had. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now please, Father, help me with the regret that I still feel for doing that. So you've already taken the big burden of guilt off of your back, and now you're dealing with a lesser burden of sadness and regret. Let that soak in because so many people don't. They will use the word guilt for almost any bad feeling rather than what it really ought to be. So, guilt is one of the big ones they have to deal with. The another one is anger. I remember the first time I was ever called into a marital conflict. I had no idea what to do. I know what I did. I sat there and I turned my head from one side to the other. As they shouted each other, told each other how worthless they were. I didn't know, I just should have said, the two of you, be quiet. Just be quiet. Sit down and take a deep breath. Well, I don't know, just sit down and let's take some deep breaths. Let's start off with a fresh start. And sometimes we have to do that to ourselves. Sometimes we have to say, self, sit down and be quiet. Relax. Deliberately relax. Deliberately try to let go of what's going on in your mind. One of the books I read said the way you can do that is you can breathe deeply and clench your fist. And as you breathe deeply, Imagine that you're actually releasing slowly, opening your hands, that you're actually releasing some of those negative feelings and negative thoughts. And you may say, that's crazy. Well, no, not really. Not really. Because we use gestures all the time of letting go. Can I go to town? There's the permission. I'm letting you go. Can I do this? There it is. You may do that. Have it your way. I'm letting go. And so we think of ways to help people figure out how to let things go. Let's look at the next one. And the next one is despair. Giving up. I think I just want to die. Is that what you think your loved one would want? I realize there are situations when, when the loved one may not even care. They may even have done what they did as an act of resentment and bitterness towards you. But I do know this. Despair is probably at the point at which you can, if you will, start looking at the other shore. That's when you're done looking back all the time and you're now willing to start looking at the other shore 
more and more. There's a sense in which probably all of the rest of your life you will look at this shore from time to time and you'll fondly remember it. But you'll also understand I'm now over here. And that's where I'm going. Midstream, tonight's point, you're in the middle of the stream, you may be in despair, you may be in depression, it's time to start looking at the other side. And here's one of the things you need to do. You need to trade the why and the what if questions for a different kind of question. Troublesome things, why and what if questions. People abandon me. No one will talk about the one I lost. I ran onto that just finished with my niece. Uh, I ran onto it Monday of this week. I ran onto it today. Nobody will talk to me about the person who died. I want to talk about them. I want to talk about what they did. I want to talk about some of the funny things we did. I want to talk about some of his honorary characteristics, her honorary characteristics, but nobody will talk to me. In fact, when I mention their name, they start changing the subjects. It's almost as if I'm supposed to pretend that this person that I invested 20, 30, 40, 50 years in doesn't exist. They're gone. Part of our healing is to remember that this person is still a part of us in memory and influence and impact on our life. And it's not a bad thing to talk about them. I think I told you this already before, but I am prone to repeat things. My niece, who's lost both her husband and her mother in the last three years. I was talking to her about one way you deal with grief is you talk about the person that's gone. And she said, at the assisted living where I'm at, nobody talks about their deceased husband. They don't even mention them. So, Linda started mentioning Gary and talking about him at the table. And the next thing you know, this other lady said, was my husband was a fireman. And here's one of the things that he really enjoyed doing. And they were able to talk about <coughs> that part of, of their life. And it, it's part of healing. Part of the healing that goes on. Rather than never being able to share what this person meant to me. And that's part of it. No one will talk about the one I lost. When I mention him or her, they become uncomfortable. And then, people say hurtful things. Sometimes the hurtful things they say were not intended to be hurtful, but they turned out that way. Um, one that I hear every once in a while is, well, God especially as if, if this is a little child. Well, God wanted another angel in heaven. You mean God looked down and says, I think I want that one and I don't want mother and daddy to have it anymore. And so now God's to blame. God's to blame. And sometimes they will say, well, it was just their time to go. And it's to treat it as a matter of fact. I do know that the book of, uh, in the Old Testament, it says that there is a time to die. But in the same passage, it says there's a time to laugh. And if people apply the same thinking to the time to laugh as they do the time to die, then that means the only time you laugh is when God has predestined it. And there's a time to plant. And there's a time to pluck up. In other words, if you planted a rose bush, was it preordained by God that you would plant a rose at that time? Because that's what we would have to say about death. The fact that there is a time to die doesn't mean an hour, a minute, a second. It means it is a part of human existence and there is a time when we will die. But it's not necessarily God says, okay, builds numbers up, doesn't matter what he's doing, he's a goner. Predestined time of death. 
Bible doesn't teach that. That's why it tells us to be careful. That's why it tells us to avoid evil. That's why he wants us to watch out. That's why we need to be on guard. That's one reason we need to eat, exercise, take care of ourselves, stay healthy, and be careful when we're out on the freeway because we're only about four feet from somebody else coming the other direction. So there is not a time to die, but that's what people will tell folks. It's time to die. One of the things that I've heard people tell a woman who's had a miscarriage is, oh honey, I'm so sorry, but you can have another one. That's not the point. The point is they lost a child. And whether they can have another one or not is not the issue. The issue is they lost a child. And that's what they're dealing with. And so many times a miscarriage is treated as, well, it just happens and that's the way it goes. But there's a lot more to it than that. And so people can say hurtful things. Well, if you would have taken better care of it, oh, I tell you, if you are the caretaker and relatives come in and start talking to you about how you took care of a person, don't be surprised if they're going to find fault with the way you did it. I think you should have called the doctor sooner. You should have been in there with them watching. And these kind of things hurt. And we need to understand that. There's another thing that a lot of people often say, and I'm, I'm curious, have you ever had anybody say to you, I know how you feel? And the truth is, nobody knows how you feel. They know how they felt. They know that they can imagine how you might have felt. But even if they went through the same thing with their own family member, they grieve in their own way. So instead of saying, I know how you feel, you might want to say, well, if it's an experience you've never had, then the best that you can give them is, I can only imagine how painful this must be. If it were happened to me, it would hurt beyond words. Or if it has happened to you, which happens to me because at my age, my mother and dad are gone, and when I deal with somebody who's lost a parent, I have to tell them, I don't know how you feel when your dad died, but I sure know how I felt when my dad died. It sure hurt and I sure miss him. And so I'm allowing them to have their own feelings. And then there's people who say, you shouldn't feel that way. There's other people who say, you ought to be over it by now. There's other people who'll say, I'm sick and tired of hearing you talk about it. People don't know how to handle your grief. They don't know what to do with you when you're grieving. They, sometimes they will even avoid talking to you because they don't know what to say and it may surprise you that they may be a good friend of yours. And you would think they would be the first ones who would run up. Sometimes that does happen, but sometimes it doesn't. And you have to accept that as normal because not everybody is able to handle grief. That brings me to something else that's not in tonight's notes at this point in place. But you do need to find somebody you can talk to that you trust. Somebody you can pour your heart out to who will listen without judging and without trying to fix you. Just listen. I'm bad about needing to fix things. You know, somebody comes to me with a problem, my job is not just to listen, my job is to fix. But sometimes I have heard people say, I don't want you to try to fix anything, I just want you to listen. I just need to talk to somebody about this. Don't tell me how to fix it. Just, just listen to me. Well, for somebody like me, sometimes that's hard to do because my nature, my personality trait says, fix it. I grew up wanting to know how things work and how to fix them. My little teddy bear that I took out to the wood pile suffered 
a serious surgery, as I have mentioned before, when I tried to find out why he squeaked. I stopped his squeak, and at that age of life, I couldn't fix it. The initial stage, we remember shock and numbness, the disbelief, the overwhelming. Did you know that God uses that as a defense system for you to keep it from overwhelming you at that point, that numbness? That's keeping the full impact from hitting you. It's giving you time for things to soak in. Then there is, in the earlier parts, that time of lamentation when the reality really hits. There is no longer the ability to say, I just can't believe it. There's no longer the way to say, it just couldn't have happened. Now you have to say, it did happen. And that tends to be when the pain really starts, is when the reality really starts. And then there tends to be the withdrawal, the time you need to stop back and, and, and just evaluate what's really going on. What's really happening? What are all of the losses connected with the loss of this person? It is rare that we ever lose someone we love and we only lose them. We lose those things connected with them. We lose someone to fill up the gas tank. We lose someone who does the bookkeeping. We lose someone who comes in and scares us. We lose someone who tells jokes that don't make any sense. Those are the things that are called secondary losses. And that's when we tend to go down toward despair and depression. And that's what starts to force us to think, I believe I need to start looking at the other shore. I need to start thinking, is this what life has for me? And you look at your faith, you look at the spirit of the person you've lost who wants you to be happy again, and you say, you know, if I look at the other shore, I think they would cheer. If I look at the other shore and realize I can live again, they would applaud it. If I look at the other shore and think there's happiness over there on a regular basis, God would be pleased with the progress. And that's what some of the things that happen at midstream. The pain comes because now you're accepting the full sense of the loss. But because you are, you're now ready to start dealing with those losses. You're already beginning to decide it's okay to fill up the car with gas. It's okay for me to pay the bills. It's okay for me to do the laundry. It's okay for me to run the vacuum cleaner. It's okay for me to consider looking for a job. It's okay for me to go out with the guys, the girls, and have fun in a godly sort of way. And that's what happens at the midstream. It's not that we have changed horses. It's that we are beginning to detach ourselves from the pain of the loss with a mixture of hope for the future. Are you with me? Turning loose of some of the pain, not all of it, all of it will never go away, but turning loose of that pain that just throbs, 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 and start looking at the fact that I believe I have a right to be happy. I have a right to be healed of this. I have a right to move on while I remember and while I appreciate, but I also have a right to a new kind of life. And that's where a person begins to find some courage and some possibility that things are going to get better. One of the books that I have, and I gave you, oh, let me talk to you about the other side. 
I do not have one of the books with me that I gave you. The book uh, that I do not have with me is the one written by the woman who started uh, MADD, MAD. Uh, she lost a child to a drunk driver, and she had to go through not only the death of being unable to say goodbye, in fact, the name of her book is When You Can't Say Goodbye, and she wrote that book and has a whole lot of information in there, and it's especially helpful for people who have suffered a tragic kind of loss. By tragic, drunk driver, somebody killed on the job, as I heard about just today. Uh, I know of one fella who was driving behind his wife. He saw the wreck ahead of him that killed his wife. That would be considered a tragic accident. No time for goodbye. Uh, a suicide, a homicide, uh, kidnapping, these kind of things would be considered tragic losses. And her book, No Time to Say Goodbye, is a good book for people who are dealing with that because in that book, she mentions those people again and again. This book right here, the guide, uh, Grief Guide book, you have one page of the contents. Do you see how many chapters there are on the table of contents? And there's only about three or four pages on each one. What he does is he takes questions that people have asked through his many years of counseling and of guiding recovery groups, and he puts these questions down. Why are people treating me this way? Uh, page 164. Uh, how do I respond to others' hurtful comments? Page 170. Uh, how can I help others who are grieving? Page 227. How can I handle special days? Page 218. Uh, would counseling help me? Page 194. Um, will this ever get any better? Page 203. And these are questions and these are answers that he has helped people learn through the years. This book by Dodds, uh, Bob Dietz, Life After Loss, is a good general book about general recovery. Doesn't deal too much with tragic deaths, but deals with those deaths that happen in most of our lives. And it is a, it is a good book. There's a man named Bob, uh, Bill Flatt who has written a book called Growing Through Grief. And his goal is to understand that when we have grief, we actually can grow spiritually through it if we choose to. But it does take work. And then there's another book, and I admit that I haven't even gotten into it, called Grieving the Right Way. And he has marked out the word R-I-G-H-T and put the word W-R-I-T-E in it. And he talks about the importance of writing. In fact, uh, he has a couple of acronyms. One of them is the word AIR, A-I-R. A, acknowledge what you're feeling, express it out loud. He's all for people going into a private room and if necessary, just shouting out loud how they feel. Getting it out, getting it out. You need to get it out. But I'd recommend doing that in private as he did. Another thing he recommends is writing down. I am so angry at name of a person, whatever you're mad at, about, and then you write what you're mad about. Do you realize what you just did? You narrowed down your anger to a specific situation that you can work with rather than just anger in general. The second word, I, identity, uh, what things do you think about behind those feelings? I'm angry because, that's a good place to get. I'm angry at because, and then fill in the blank as you talk or as you write. And then R is release. And he's the one who suggested grip your hands tight, release them slowly as if releasing the feelings and the thoughts behind them. And then he has TWA. And I realize he did mention that used to be the name of an airline. But T, talk it out, out loud, share with someone that's safe, and this slows us down. Many times our thoughts are like a machine gun, but when we're talking to people, they have to work more like a single shot. We have to stop and think. And sometimes when we stop and think, we realize some things that we wouldn't have realized otherwise. 
And then the second thing, write it out. He strongly recommends a journal. Strongly recommends a journal. Me, I'm not so much of a journal person, but I know I have people in my family that are. But the reason for this is you write down on Monday, Monday was a rough day. I cried two hours today. And what was so concerning to me was and I was angry about this and I was hurt about this. And then you write down what happens the next day. And about a month later, you go back and you read. And in all probability, you will see progress. The progress that you're making. You may cry today, but it may not be two hours. It may be 30 minutes. And your anger may be much shorter. And other things may be on your mind. And so you're actually recording your progress of growth. And uh, Gary re uh, reminds, uh, recommends that very, very strongly. And then art it out. I guess we all know that when children are dealing with high emotional things, the one thing we do is you give them a crayon and a piece of paper and tell them to draw something. And by what they draw, you can kind of find out what's going on. And sometimes they will draw something specific enough that you know kind of what needs to be dealt with in their life. Some people will sculpt, some go to crafts, but I have found that most of the time it needs to involve doing it hands-on rather than simply thinking about it. Hands on. Outside help that's along the way as I look at the clock, God in prayer, in the Bible, good books, some I've recommended to you. There are many books on grief out there. Talking to someone who you trust and is safe. Uh, and remember these things. And this wraps up tonight. I will not always feel as I do now. I'm doing okay. Grief will not hurt me. I will make it through my loss as others have made it through theirs, and I will not rush through my grief. Let's pray. Father, we humans would like to have words to say to take away grief. Easily, quickly, but we don't have those words. Even the words in the Bible do not always take away the pain but they're there to give us hope and assurance. They're there to help us find peace within our soul, even though peace within our world may not be what we have at the moment. Thank you, Father, for those people who are struggling with grief, who are working their way through it, who do not feel like there is no hope, but like the psalmist, realize that they may be in the valley of the shadow of death, but there is a light at the end for those who love you and walk with Jesus. It is in his name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.